Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you've stuck around. I thought I might be talking to the back wall by this stage. So this is some work we did at the University of Melbourne uh, with my former postdoc, Hardy Dolatabadi, who's now working for Oracle, and my, uh, one of my colleagues, Sarah Rafani. And what we've been looking at is the challenge of how to make data uh, unexploitable on the internet or on the social web so that people can't build machine learning models from your data. There's a range of existing defences for that. So I'll start by talking about what I mean by unexploitable data. Uh, then I'll talk about our method for trying to defeat the existing methods for um, creating unexploitable data. See, you know, is this really possible in practice? I'll show our experimental results, which say, which tend to demonstrate that, yeah, I wouldn't be too putting, betting my house on uh, the idea of unexploitable data in terms of its robustness, and highlight some of the challenges for uh, safety in this context. So obviously, your networks need lots of data. If you're training uh, data, or training a model with images, usually companies go out, scrape the internet, and so soak up a whole lot of images uh, to create some sort of huge data set for training. Now this is great. It helps us build more accurate neural network models, but if your data is in there, your personal data has been hoovered up by the company doing the machine learning and you don't want it to be in there, what can you do about it? What can you do to stop that? So imagine a, a situation where um, you've put your photo up on the web and someone crawls the web, gets your photo, builds it into their uh, model that they've trained and they've developed a face recognition system so that when someone uses that face recognition uh, software, they recognise you individually. You might not like that. You might not want that. You might want to be able to put your data online, your image online, but not have the or protect it in a way that people can't use it to build some sort of unauthorised uh, use of that data. So this is the concept of unexploitable data. This has been a topic of um, recent interest about whether it's possible to add some sort of uh, poisoning attack to the data that you put online. So if you have your image, can you add some sort of relatively imperceptible perturbation to create an availability attack so that if someone then tries to use your data, your image, they won't be able, their, their training algorithm won't be able to make use of it. Your face won't be recognised by the face recognition model that they train, for example. And we're not limiting ourselves to face recognition. I'm just using that as an illustrative scenario. So these, there's a range of techniques that have been developed to create um, availability attacks. These methods tend to add imperceptible noise, ideally, to clean data, so that the neural networks are basically um, hobbled in terms of being able to uh, learn from that protected data. So we then feel by adding the noise, slight, the, the, the image, your image still looks like you to a human, but you can put it up on the web with confidence that some, somebody can't use it for their nefarious purpose. Or can they? So how much of this is, uh, is, is unexploitability a reality or not? So it ends up making some fairly strong assumptions from a, a pragmatic perspective. So let's say you've applied your data protection to your image and you've put it up 
on the World Wide Web. But there are plenty of other images of what people look like that can be um, that are available for people to be working with. So, someone who's trying to uh, disable the availability attack on your image or on images in general can make use of generative models that are trained with other data sets of images. Those generative models can then be applied to data out on the internet. And so in this way, it's able to denoise the images that have been protected using the unavailability uh, attack or the availability attack. And then as a result, the, data, the image that was previously protected is now denoised and can be used uh, for training whatever application that you want, say the face recognition problem. So we were interested to see, can you come up with a, an a, a, I guess you can call this an attack on an attack. It's sort of like a counter attack. Can you come up, gosh, what a complicated world we live in. Um, can you come up with a method for effectively stripping out the, uh, the noise that's been added to protect the, um, to, to, for, that's been added for in the protected images. So to do this, we build on diffusion models. People have been talking in the previous talks about diffusion models, so I won't dwell on it, just to remind you. Um, we go through a forward pass where we're adding some sort of Gaussian noise in stages uh, to an image and then we go through a reverse diffusion process uh, based on some sort of Markov chain that reconstitutes the image, uh, denoises the image. So we're, and by adding noise in stages, we're able to uh, reconstruct, uh, we're then able to systematically remove the noise and reconstruct the image. And so we train a model, um, denoted by S here, on some data set that allows us to do this denoising process. So our approach to stripping out the protection is what we call avatar. And so remember that the availability attacks are adding imperceptible perturbations to protect the image. To get rid of this protection, uh, what we're doing is we're first adding some additional noise, just Gaussian noise in, a, um, in the forward pass of our diffusion model, and then denoising the image. And as a result of the denoising, it not only strips out, or what we hope, is that it not only strips out the noise that we've added, but can it also strip out the noise that was added as the protection to the image? So this can then be a form of pre-processing. By using Avatar, you can take your images, take images from the internet, run them through Avatar. They might have, they might be protected, they might not. It strips the noise, it adds noise in, strips the noise out, and hopefully removes the protective perturbations. And it isn't specific to a particular model that you're trying to learn or a particular type of uh, adversarial um, perturbation. The amount of noise in the, so we've got to carefully craft it so that the amount of noise, the number of diffusion steps needs to be small enough to retain the image semantics whilst uh, being large enough to suppress the data perturbation mechanism. So here you can see we've taken an image which may or may not be protected. In the forward process, we add the Gaussian noise, we get a noisy version of the image with our noise and the protective noise. We run the reverse process 
of diffusion and we get the sanitised data, which should then be cleaned up and able to be used, no longer protected. So we've done a certain amount of uh, theoretical analysis on what sort of bounds there are on the amount of noise that needs to be added to, and then relate the estimation error between the sanitised data and the clean, clean image with the original level of perturbation on the protected image. And this sort of comes down to setting the, the step size of the noise that we're adding in. And you can, uh, maybe an impossibility theorem is too strong. You know, that's why we've got a question mark there. It's perhaps a little bit strong. But what we're saying is essentially what all this boils down to is that we can show that if you want to add, if, if you want to protect your image against our um, cleaning mechanism, then basically the, the amount of noise you add in is directly related to the amount of perturbation we can be adding in and clean, cleaning things up. So the, the heart of it is, yes, you could continue to protect the images, but you're going to have to add more and more noise to them and the whole point of the, um, the unlearnability was that it should be imperceptible. And we give examples in the paper that um, for a lot of the adversarial attacks, even the ones, even when we can still um, defeat them, they're adding significant noise that is very perceptible to de that are degrading the quality of the image. So here's an example of protected image, the perturbation that was added to that to create the protected image, our noisy version of the image, so we've added our Gaussian noise and the resulting sanitised image for one particular type of um, availability attack. We've got examples for a rate half a dozen different types of availability attacks that we've tested on. And you can see the, the final quality of the image um, at each stage. So we want to test this. We look at the test accuracy of ResNet classifiers trained over data, say CIFAR 10, SVHN, CIFAR 100 and so on. We look at what's the clean accuracy of our classifier. We then look at if we apply one of these, one of these availability attacks, so the six different availability attacks that we've tested on, what is the accuracy of our classifier on the protected data? And you can see that in most cases, it comes down to you know 10% or even less. So the availability attacks are doing what they're supposed to do. And these, well, at least at the time we wrote the paper, these were the top six um, state-of-the-art availability attacks. We then see what happens if we apply Avatar to strip out the availability attack and then use that ex those examples in our training, what sort of accuracy are we able to guess on the, on the model that's trained on the images that have had the, the availability perturbation stripped out of them? And then you can see we're getting up to fairly comparable values of not quite as good as the clean, original clean data, but just a few percent off. So what this is telling us is that basically um, none of these attacks were able to uh, really guarantee the protection of the data. We could just use adversarial training to do this. That's one approach that's been proposed in the past to, deal, to um, attack 
uh, availability attacks. So in these results for different data sets, we're looking at the test accuracy of the clean data, how the clean, how the accuracy of training improves if we use adversarial training of, with different uh, radius values and each solid curve here corresponds to the data with a particular um, perturbation uh, for availability attacks. So we can see that yes, as we apply stronger and stronger adversarial training, we can improve the um, ability to learn from the data. But if we look at the dashed lines, these are the equivalent results are when the data has been cleaned using Avatar, we're getting almost comparable uh, accuracy. We also, as the clean data, we also looked at the diffusion time step. So this is probably the main thing you've got to fiddle with to get right. Too much uh, noise, you, if the diffusion time step's too high, the accuracy starts to drop off, but there's still a reasonable range, which for one setting across all the different types of uh, adversarial models uh, gives similar results. We also looked at the distribution mismatch. mismatch. Remember, our reverse pass requires us to have, of our um, diffusion model, require, requires us to have a model. And we looked at, well, what if that's trained on an entirely different data set from the one so the diffusion model's been trained on one data set and we're looking at protecting a different data set. We find that not much difference in the performance of Avatar. So we're not reliant on having the, the same distribution of the data to construct our diffusion model. These are some examples of uh, my co-authors with different levels of um, noise added to them and uh, sanitisation. We also applied to face recognition, essentially showing that if we had um, the original data, yes, the protection works pretty well compared to the clean data, but if we've got avatar applied for face recognition, there's very little diff protection resulting. So in summary, we've talked about the nature of availability attacks. Um, we've highlighted a weakness in terms of the reliance on that there's other sources of data out there that we can be using to construct, uh, to reconstruct the image. And we can do that using a denoising approach um, based on the diffusion model, in, which is in our form of algorithm called avatar. And which the results that we have tend to indicate that if we want to protect against availability, or if we want to provide some sort of reliable availability attack to stop people using our images, we're kind of back to the drawing board. So that's something for you to work on for the next conference. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.